And Moses called all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your ears this day, that ye may learn them and keep and do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us, who are all of us here alive this day. The Lord talked with you face to face in the mount out of the midst of the fire. I stood between the Lord and you at that time to show you the word of the Lord, for ye were afraid by reason of the fire and went not up into the mount, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. Thou shalt have none other gods before me. Thou shalt not make thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the waters beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Six days thou shalt labor, and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. And remember thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Honor thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, that thy days may be prolonged and that, they, that it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, neither shalt thou commit adultery, neither shalt thou steal, neither shalt thou bear false witness against thy neighbor, neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife, neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house, his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant, his ox, or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. These words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount, out of the midst of the fire, of the cloud, and of the thick darkness, with a great voice, and he added no more. And he wrote them in two tables of stone, and delivered them unto me. And it came to pass, when ye heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness, for the mountain did burn with fire, that ye came near unto me, even all the heads of your tribes and your elders, and ye said, Behold, the Lord our God hath showed us his, his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire, and we have seen this day that God doth talk with man, and he liveth. Now therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us, if we hear the voice of the Lord our God in any more, then we shall die. For who is there of all flesh that hath heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fire, as we have and lived? Go thou near, and hear all that the Lord our God shall say, and speak thou unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee, and we will hear it and do it. And the Lord heard the voice of your words when he spake unto me. And the Lord said unto me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people, which they have spoken unto thee. They have well said all that they have spoken. Oh, that there were such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Go say to them, get you into your tents again. But as for thee, stand thou here by me, and I will speak unto thee all the commandments and statutes and the judgments which thou shalt teach them, that they may do them in the land which I give unto them to possess it. Ye shall observe to do, therefore, as the Lord your God hath commanded you. Ye shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Ye shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you, that ye may live, and that it may be well with you, and that ye may prolong your days in the land 
which ye shall possess. Deuteronomy chapter 5 is stressing heavily the words of the Lord and the interaction of people with them. Uh, the people that go and stand before God receiving a message which they would deliver. It talks about how God gave the commandments in an audible voice that caused great, caused great terror unto the people so that they said, send somebody else to hear his voice. But it also records the, the transmission of the voice of God into um, writing when it became a table that the people could hold and review and, and, and have interaction with on a daily basis. If you go back into verse 1, there's a typical and very important charge given to the people of Israel. Deuteronomy 5 and verse 1 says, And Moses called all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your ears this day, that ye may learn them and keep them and do them. What's the charge here? First, learn these statutes. That means hearken unto them, engage with them, allow them to, to come into you and, to, and, to, and have understanding of them as they do so. The second charge, keep these commandments. That means you should retain and, and remember them. Keep them, possess them, grab a hold of them. You've heard, now take them and make them your own. Keep them with thee. And the third point and a very important charge is do them. That means take what you have heard, take what you've retained, and apply and practice it in a very real way. Physically do as God has taught you and then charge that you would remember and retain. Continuing on in verse 2, it says, The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. Verse 3, the Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us who are all of us here alive this day. The word of God is practical for you. And here four times in those two verses, it's for us, it's for us, it's for us, it's for us. That's the preacher Moses applying it to all the people there. This isn't some obscure language that's for somebody else, some obscure wording that's for somebody else. No, God spake to all of us who are alive this day. Day. He made not this covenant with your fathers. And look at this covenant. You can go to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19, keeping a finger there in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And in Exodus chapter 19, you're going to find this was first delivered to the fathers. Exodus 19 and verse 5. Right before these same Ten Commandments, which are being recorded again unto a second group of people, God says this, Exodus 19 and verse 5. Now therefore, what's that word? If. Therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. God charging that he would go to them and say, Hey, if you keep this covenant, if you keep these words, if you obey those words, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. You want to be God's special and privileged chosen people? Obey his words, is what God is saying, very clearly. Right? There is an if you obey and keep, then you will be peculiar. Then you will be a kingdom of priests. Then you will be a holy nation unto God. And what was the response of the people? Look in verse 8. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. So the people's response is, Yes, amen, we will do it. All that God hath commanded we will do. And what is God about to command? The very Ten Commandments. We are just about to read about. So then why did he say in the second iteration that this commandment was for us and not for our fathers when the fathers here are very clearly reading and hearing of the commandment? Well, go and look to Numbers chapter 14. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers chapter 14. And in verse 26, the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation, which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness." 
and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from 20 years old and upward which have murmured against me doubtless you shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein save Caleb the son of Jephumi and Joshua the son of Nun but your little ones which ye said should be a prey then will I bring in and they shall know the land which ye have despised but as for you, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. It continues. And your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years and bear your whoredoms, and your car until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days which ye searched for the land, even forty days, each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities, even forty years shall ye know my breach of promise. I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do unto all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me in this wilderness. They shall be consumed, and there they shall die. What's God saying here? Because of the murmurings, because of their unwillingness, talking of the fathers now, to obey his words that he delivered in Mount Horeb, God is now making them to know the breach of his promise. He is going to breach or break the land promise that was given to them, that they would enter into a promised land and there abide safely and securely. He's breaking that promise, not because he is, is some sort of renegger of the promise, but because they didn't uphold their side of it. And what was their side of it? If ye will obey, then will I promise, give you what I promised unto you. But if not, God is very clear. He will return from the promise that he made and do it not for them. Therefore the transition was made. It was not for the fathers to receive of the covenant, but this second group, according to the word of the Lord. Now what's the general practical that you can grab from this? And you can go back to Deuteronomy chapter 5. When God says the covenant is for us, he made it with us. Those of us who are alive this day and not to our fathers. What is this telling us just on a practical level as a Christian believer? That means that just because your grandma was a Christian or your mom was a Christian or you're a pastor's son or, or you grew up in church because your parents were saved and believers, that does not give you complete and total promise to just be passed down. Saved parents, grandma's a saint, that does not guarantee a promise of anything from God to the child. Salvation isn't hereditary. You don't just receive it because the fathers received it. And it's plain that even if the fathers don't receive it, you still have opportunity to receive it yourself. The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 18, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. In Romans 2 verse 6, God said, Who will render to every man according to his deeds. That is given specific application to the one person that received. That, that means every one of us is responsible for our own sins. That means every one of us is accountable for our own sins. And our righteousnesses as well. It falls on the individual to make the decision to do well. And that's how God's promise transfers. If he will obey, then shall I bless, give the promise, give what I promised unto you. That's what he's saying here in the context of the possession of the land. Now, if you go to verse 4, the Bible continues, and it says, The Lord talked with you face to face in the mount of the midst of the fire. And so there were many that are now standing here today, 40 years later, that whether they were 20 or, or under, then maybe they were just little babies at that time. Now they're 60, perhaps. Some of them are 20 years old now. There were many that remember when God spoke to them face to face in the mount out of the midst of the fire. Verse 5 says, I stood between the Lord and you at that time to show you the word of the Lord, for ye were afraid by reason of the fire and went not up into the mount. So these people knew, and they ought to remember, the fear that drove their parents and their fathers, by type, to demand a mediator. They ought to remember because they heard the thundering. Perhaps they heard their parents back at home talking about how terrible it was to hear the voice of God. We need someone to go for us. We are too afraid to step into that mountain to hear the word of God on a one-on-one -on -one basis. 
Even Moses himself as the leader chosen to be a mediator to go unto God in person and bring the message down, said of that experience, I exceeding fear and quake. He's shaking from the fear of standing before God in person and hearing his words as a face-to-face -face experience. And so we ought to see then that even for the, the believer, the young child, the, the man of God, all should fear and quake before the word of the Lord. Especially in this case when God speaks it face to face into somebody, but also that transfers unto the position that we're standing in now where we just have these words in paper on black and white. We ought to have the mindset that we exceedingly fear and quake at the hearing of the word of the Lord. Continues on, and we'll read through the Ten Commandments and just give a little bit of application for them. The first, in verse 6, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt have none other gods before me. That is saying, don't have any gods before God in his place, in any kind of position. There is God, there is none else. On top of that, verse 8 continues and says, Thou shalt not make thee any graven image, or likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or is in the earth beneath, or that is in the waters under the earth. And this continues, Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And God fulfilled that promise when they, um, in their whoredoms, created other gods unto themselves. You remember the brazen... Um, a cow that they made, that golden calf that they made. He promised that the iniquity of the fathers would be visited unto the children of the third and fourth generation. And he fulfilled that when he made those children wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Now, he didn't hold them accountable for their sin, but certainly the sin of the fathers had a profound effect on the children. That's why I all need to be cautious, because decisions we're making now affect our children. Amen? The decisions that we make... People, I've heard this said often, I'm trying to remember the exact phrase, basically says, what you do in moderation, your children will take to an extreme. And that was seen in the life of Solomon, when his children acted out in rebellion against God and took upon many wives in the same way that he does. We need to be cautious of our actions now because we will affect the children that are following. Here in the context, it says, don't make a graven image. Don't be molding something that is a creation of God and bowing down and worshiping it. In that manner, it kind of pairs up with the command before, no other gods before me. Don't place anything in any kind of position of venerance or worship. Continues on, and we'll read in verse 10, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Amen. Following God's commands is how you get mercy in this life. Verse 11, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughters nor thy manservant nor thy maidservant, and continues on. But they shall rest even as thou. Verse 15, it says, And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and the Lord thy God brought thee thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. So because of who God is and what he did, that's why we ought to follow off and after in his example, and that's to be holy and have a separate day set aside for resting. Talking about the children of Israel in the Old Testament now. He continues on in verse 16, Honor thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. And it's, it continues and says that thy days may be prolonged and that it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. That's the first command with promise. We know that. Thou shalt not kill, do no murder is what Christ called that. Neither shalt thou commit adultery. Neither shalt thou steal. Neither shalt thou bear false witness against thy neighbor. Neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife. Neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house, his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant, his ox, or his ass, or anything that is their neighbor's. That's talking about covetousness. Be content with what you have. Don't be coveting after what your neighbor has and desiring that for yourself. What I want to grab a hold of is the beginning of this in verse 22. It says, These words the Lord spake. Back in Exodus chapter 20, I want to give you the same words. It says, And God spake all these words, saying, 
Now, from the position of a Bible-believing Christian, we have to decide, is the Bible true all the time? Do we believe every word of God? Okay, and then we need to take something like that and say, God spake all these words saying... Do we just believe that God spake those words and they thundered in the mount? Or do we actually believe that these words in the context of the word of God are exactly what God spake? I will hazard that these are some of my favorite seven words in this order in the entire Bible. And I grab hold of them 100% and say, yep, amen, it's true. And God spake all these words saying, and then the Ten Commandments come out. To me... In English, though they were spoken in another language, God spake literally all these words saying, okay? He continues on, back in Deuteronomy chapter 5, These words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount, out of the midst of the fire, of the cloud, and of the thick darkness, with a great voice, and he added no more. And he wrote them into tables of stone, and delivered them unto me. So there was the transmission made from God speaking these words to God literally penning them with his finger on tables of stone. These exact words in Hebrew, fair, and gave them unto Moses. And so the people had a perfect replica of the words of God in their own language exactly as he spoke them. And I believe that we have the same thing today. With no more added, with no more taken away. He delivered, as it were, the paper to them. He spake them, he recorded it perfectly, and handed it over. This was the tangible contract that the people had. It was penned out, and the people confessed every word we will do. That was the exchange that was made. Back in the day, I guess you didn't have to sign contracts. You just had to, you know, your word was good enough. God's word certainly was good enough. We know that man's quite often isn't. And that's where they fell short. They said, we'll do it. And God said, if you will, I will bless you. I will keep you. I will give you the promised land. Of course they didn't. And that's why God had to take back his end of the promise. Because it was broken. But here, perfectly it comes out. These words the Lord spake, and God spake all these words, saying, and we have them here today. Go to Psalm chapter 12, and verse 6. Keep your finger in Deuteronomy. Psalm chapter 12, and in verse 6. I prepared this message like Wednesday night in, in hopes of delivering it on Thursday. Never happened. But here we are in this word today. Thank you, Lord. Deuteronomy 12 and verse 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure words. Okay, we have to decide if we believe that or not. What does purity mean? That means without anything else, really. If you have a pure hunk of gold, that means every impurity, every bit of dust, of dirt, of contamination has been refined out of it. Now, we know in actuality nothing exists as far as gold is concerned in the purest form. But... Purity would give you, uh, basically, there's nothing else but it. Completely pure, 100% what we're talking about. So the words of the Lord are pure words. They're 100% the words of God. And we need to believe that. By faith, we look at this and we say, okay. And this is one of the ways that I look at the Bible. I say, okay, do I believe that? Of course. But I don't have that thought every single time I open the scriptures and come to something that maybe I didn't know before or I disagreed with before in times past. I just open it with with the guarantee that I believe it. I often say to people, people will say like, what do you think about Ezekiel 12 verse 3? And I will say, I believe it. Okay? I didn't turn there. I don't have it memorized. But you can give me any verse of the Bible and say, what do you think about it? Before I even open it, I say, I believe it. That's faith. That's 100% resolve to trust the word of God's, the word of God before I even go and search it out myself. Okay? So the words of the Lord are pure words, and here it is. As silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. So that gives you that idea of a metal that's being purified and purified and purified. And every time it goes through that furnace, more dross comes off of it. More of the contamination comes off of it. More of the other stuff comes off of it until you have 100% pure words of God. Thou, look at this in verse 7, thou. Now who is doing this? Who is he talking to? Well, we're going to find out. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Okay, who's keeping the words? The Lord is. Not the translators. 
not the faithful scribes, not men of any type, shape, or form, okay? Thou shalt keep them. What's that talking about? The words, the pure words, the words of the Lord. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation, David talking, forever. Do you believe in an eternal security of your salvation? you got to believe in an eternal security and preservation of the Word of God. Otherwise, you've got nothing to stand on. God's right, He promised, because of His Word, having the promises made in it, that's what I stand on. It's the only reason I have any faith in a living God is because He took what He said, He penned it out, and He brought it to me in the form of a Bible. Paper copy of the Bible, no another. And he says, thou shalt keep them. David talking about his God. Thou shalt preserve them. My heart crying out to my same God in the same way. Verse 8 just says, the wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. That was just for free. We continue on, and we see back in Deuteronomy chapter 22, that statement, these words the Lord spake. Now, we take what we've learned. They're pure. They're kept. They're preserved by God that said them. And now here I have a more sure word of this very prophecy. And I'm getting ahead of myself. But here it says that all of the assembly heard it. And this is just another aside. Now were there some that were not assembled that didn't hear the word that day? Perhaps. The Bible says all of the assembly heard it. I bet you those that didn't show up, well, they might have been a little disappointed. They missed God showing up to the congregation, to the assembly, and speaking to them. They might have been disappointed. I bet you they were thankful that God did write it out so that they could still hear it from others, maybe even look at the tablets themselves. That's what God said, okay. And then they had to make the same decision, having received a table, a table, and the testimony of people that said, God spake these words, God spake these words. You know what they had to do? They had to, by faith, say... Okay, you are testifying that God spake these words. We have all these witnesses that say God spake these words, so I believe that God spake these words. And by faith, they had to make the conscious decision that you and I do today. Because we weren't there to hear the Ten Commandments thunder from the mountaintop. We only have the testimony within the Word of God that that happened and that God spake these very words, giving very high importance to the words of God in particular. Now, there are likely some that did not hear the words, but had to, by faith, receive what was said. We're going to continue on. In verse 23, the Bible says, And it came to pass, when ye heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness, for the mountain did burn with fire, that ye came near unto me, even all the heads of your tribes of Israel, all the heads of your tribes and your elders, and ye said, Behold, the Lord our God hath showed us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God doth talk with men, and he liveth. Okay? Now, this is an interesting statement, because the more you kind of read it, you kind of maybe wonder, maybe I don't know all the rules of English to perfection, but either it's in spite of or because of his glory, his greatness, and his voice... That, that, that last statement, God doth talk with man and he liveth, is, is kind of, try, you try to understand it. So, what I think that they're saying is, God doth talk with men. God talks with men. So God interacts with men through his words. And secondly, and he liveth. Okay? They say, I believe, a great truth here, which Jesus affirmed. God doth talk with man, and he liveth. Okay? Jesus affirmed it when he said, Man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So if we are alive and quickened today, spiritually speaking, it's because we live by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It's not every, every saying, it's not every catchy phrase, you know, um... That, that, that men come up with to convince somebody to believe in Jesus that somebody lives, they live because of every word that proceedeth out of his mouth. Jesus is highlighting that. And I believe the people are saying the same thing. God doth talk. We have seen, because of his voice coming out, because of his greatness, and because of his glory that we have seen, we have seen that God doth talk with men, and he liveth. They say God talks 
and God lives. And I, th I think that's kind of the, the, the confusion that they found. Jesus said, God talks and his words make men alive. These people are saying, God talks and God lives, I believe is what they're saying. Why? Because the very next phrase talks about, now, therefore, why should we die? So based on that statement, they're not putting their faith in the fact that they've heard the words of God and they're going to live, are they? They're saying, we've heard the words of God and we're going to die because of this thing. Because of God's voice being so great, God's voice being so glorious, God's voice thundering from the clouds. I believe the people in this moment of fear and doubt and quaking before God say, God talks with men, God liveth. We see that. We see that he's a living God. Amen. But we don't want to hear his voice anymore. We don't want to hear his words anymore. The truth, though, and Jesus affirmed, is that God talks and men live. Read it that way. God doth talk with men, and he liveth. When God speaks to men, they live. We live by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Keep your finger, go to John chapter 5. Keep your finger, go to John chapter 5. John chapter 5 and verse 24, it says, Verily, verily, John 5 verse 24, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Back in Deuteronomy, I believe the people were not understanding the fact that who hears God is life, is living. Even the dead that hear the voice of the Son of God, they shall live by that word. And so back in Deuteronomy chapter 5, they made the statement, God talks with men, God lives, but no, God spoke to men in order that they might have life. They did not believe this, or they did not grasp the fullness of the great truth that God talks with man and gives life thereby. We ought to believe and trust in the word of God that is being presented today and draw near unto it. I could take you, and I should have before, John chapter 6 now. John chapter 6. My apologies, I got ahead of myself. But in John chapter 6... The men did the opposite. The men did exactly what the people in the time of the Ten Commandments being delivered did here in John chapter 6 when the Son of Man was speaking unto them the words of God. John chapter 6 and verse 63 it says, in, It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who would betray him. Now who is he talking about? Those that have heard the words and did not believe them. He says, the words that I give to you, they are spirit, they are life. If you receive these words, the Bible says you have everlasting life, and he continues on, and they said, this is verse 65, and he said, therefore say unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given him of the Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Now this is an interesting transition that made. You can actually go to Deuteronomy chapter 5 now. That the men are hearing the words of God. And he's saying the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But the spirit can't be grabbed with flesh and blood, can it not? The spirit must be, that realm must be accessed by faith and in the spirit of man yoking up with the spirit of God. So what happened here was that these disciples had a one-on-one -on -one with the word of God, and the word of God told them something that they didn't like, and instead of drawing onto the word of God with fullness of faith, they went back and followed him no more. And that plays out perfectly in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Verse 25, they said, Now therefore, why should we die? If they understood that God's speaking with you so that you can live, why would they make that statement? Now therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. 
if we hear the voice of the Lord our God anymore, then we shall die. For who is there of all flesh that hath heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fire as we have and lived? Go thou near and hear all that the Lord shall say and speak unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee and we will hear and like thank you Lord for this. Okay. The focus has been on the words of God throughout this entire play, right? Through this entire example given. Jesus said it time and time again, the words, the words, the words, okay? The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. It's about the words. God spake all these words, saying, okay? Now what did the people ask for? Where are the, what's the direction of these people? God doth talk with men and God liveth. We understand that. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God, we will die. Who is there that has heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fire? He says unto the Moses, Go thou near and hear all that the Lord shall say, and speak unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto you. We will hear it and do it. There's a transfer that made just in these very verses where the words are being focused on and now they're saying, just tell us what God says. Tell us what his voice says. Tell us what he speaks unto you and then we will hear it. Okay? They're asking for some sort of in between. There is God's voice. There is the words that he said, which were promised here. And now they're asking for the stinking meaning of what God is saying. They're saying, give unto us all that he shall say. And they didn't say, Moses, give unto us the word of God. Give what God is saying. Give his gist. Give what his meaning is and his purpose was in talking to us. We will do that. We will follow after that. And all that the Lord shall speak unto thee, Moses, what he talks to you, what was he talking to Moses of? The word of God. So you would think it would be enough for them to just say, God, we don't want to hear his voice because it's too loud and thunderous. Give us the words and we will do them. But they don't want the words. Men don't want the word of God because the word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than two-edged sword. The word of God is preserved. The word of God is perfect and without error. The word of God will convince you and reveal the thoughts and intents of your heart. Men don't want that. They would rather just hear what God says. They would rather just hear what is spoken unto some other man and how the man transmits it. They don't want the words of God. They want God's meaning. They want God's instructions. They want God's explanations. They're asking for something different than what they were just given. And it's not just, I believe, a fear of the thundering voice of God that they're running from. I believe it's the very words of God that they are running from. And the same thing happened in Jesus' day when he started to speak the word of God and say that that is what will give you life, and they drew back and followed him no more. They wanted nothing to do with what was given unto them. Moses continues, Go, in verse 27, Go near, they said, and hear all that the Lord shall say, and speak unto us all the Lord, and da 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 it says, All that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee, and we will hear it and do it. What has happened here? is that they've given up their position as a kingdom of priests just as their fathers did. Okay, can you see that? They had the opportunity to go and to speak with God face to face and one on one. They had the opportunity as priests to hear the word of God and to live the word of God and be immediately responsible for the word of God. And yet they have given up priesthood that was promised originally in Exodus 19 when they said, If you will obey, then shall you be kingdom of priests unto me. They gave up direct access to God, to the word of God. Instead, they want second-hand spiritual meat. And, I, and rest assured, if everybody here is only relying on second-hand spiritual food, you are malnourished. 
We have the very words of God at our disposal. And if we're sitting there saying, I don't want to hear the voice of God, I would rather have Moses, the man of God, go and be my priest and gather up what God is saying and transmit it to you as a fallible and weak man. If that's your spiritual meat, you are starving yourself and removing from yourself your responsibility and your blessing to be a priest of God. Have direct access to his word and to his throne. No matter how well I study, no matter how well I prepare, no matter how diligent I am to convey the word of God to you, standing up here, I will always fall short because every illustration falls short of the truth. Every shadow or type falls short of the reality. You can't look at the shadow cast behind me and say, that is Brother Josh. No, that is just an image of me. And in the same way, the Bible will, and the Bible will give me truths. I will take them and deliver them to you as representations of the truth. And if that's all you've got, then you're missing out. And that's what these people begged for. They wanted to know God's sense. They wanted to know God's meaning. They just wanted to hear preaching. They just wanted to hear what someone's explanation of the words of God is. And they gave up their direct access to the Father when he said... These words spake I. When he said, the Lord spake all these words, and he gave them the very words which give life. My words will not give you life. My words are like the McDonald's Happy Meal of life. Okay? They will not sustain you. They will not give you nourishment. They will not help you. Best I can, I draw from his words and try to deliver them to you. Right? But God's words are like the filet mignon compared to stinking happy meal, okay? These people wanted the happy meal. They, they wanted somebody else to go dig the word up for them. All of this is just highlighting, this whole chapter, I believe, is highlighting the importance of the word of God and how it came to us. God spake, God penned it, God preserved it, gave it to his men, right? The right heart and the right attitude would have been like, thank you for the words of God on a table of stone. Let's take these words of God and copy them out. And then every one of us can have the words of God and we can go to the word of God and we can get life from that. We can take example from the preaching. We can learn things from the preacher. We can, we can glean truths from his expounding of what God says, but ultimately, I have his word. I have his words. This is important. In verse 22, it says, He spake to all, and then these all would rather get second-hand spiritual truths from a man. And God sees it. In verse 28, he says, And the Lord heard the voice of your words when he spake unto me, and the Lord said unto me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people, which they have spoken unto thee. They have well said all that they have spoken. So they're, they're speaking from their hearts. They're well speaking what, what is on their minds and on their hearts. Look at the lamentation in verse 29. Oh, oh that there were such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep my commandments always. Remember what we talked about what keeping was? That was retaining. That was possessing them. Making them your own. The very commands of God. Oh that they would keep all my commandments always. That it might be well with them and with their children. Gives the charge to Moses, in verse 30. Go say unto them, get you into your tents again. Go home, return to your own place. And then he says this, and, and, and would to God that everyone would wander back to their own tents, but would, would, as Moses is about to do, but as for thee, stand out here by me, and I will speak unto thee all the commandments and the statutes, and the judgments which thou shalt teach them, that they may do them in the land which I give to them to possess. Ye shall observe to do therefore as the Lord your God hath commanded you. Ye shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Ye shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you, that ye may live, and that it may be well with you, and that ye may prolong your days in the land which ye shall possess." It's like they gave up the opportunity to just have access to the very Word of God. To have access to His personal teaching. He says, come now, stand by me. I will speak unto thee. I will give you the commandments. I will give you the judgment. I will give you the statutes that you may do them and live by them. We should all embrace our priesthood 
as believers. As Hebrew 4 says, enter in boldly into the throne of grace that you might have help in time. Enter boldly into the presence of God to hear his words. And there's no more, more present to you than the words of God that are contained in this book, the King James Bible. Now, I don't believe all the ins and outs of how this thing came to be. But like I said, I don't need to. I was born again by these words. These words have been tried and true for 400 years. It's good enough to me. I've, I've investigated some of the intellectualism behind how these words came to pass, and it gets lost in the, the drivel of it all. Because ultimately, you have to come to a point where you trust what God is saying by faith. When he says in his word, now someone's going to accuse me of circular reasoning, when God says in his words, these words the Lord spake, or God spake all these words saying, do I need to understand the mechanism by which those words became exactly what they are perfectly so that I can behold them in English to believe that? Do I need to go and write charts and graphs and find out men that were involved in in the translation and how you know it went through time and was was this English became this English became this English to where finally we got the language solidified and then finally we got the Bible solidified and then they went and took many great translations and made them better. Do I need to understand all of those things to just look at the Bible and say, well, it says these words the Lord spake. I believe it. No, I don't. This is the problem that a lot of people have with regard to anything in the area of God and the faith and Christianity is they need to be like atheist acts with regard to these things. I need to have all the proof, the tangible evidence. I need to have everything lined up in order for me to give faith to God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That doesn't fit into the realm of practical science where you have to prove something. Faith gets to a point where I have reason enough to just suspend my reason in some areas and believe in a holy God that spake these words, put them on bricks of stone, tables of stone, that were smashed, then man put them on there again, and somehow God had that man create the same thing. In Jeremiah, you have a scroll. The book of Jeremiah, written on a scroll, brought to a king in condemnation of that king. The king said, nuts to this. Popped out his penknife. Shh, shh, little by little. Shh, 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 threw that thing into the fire. Jeremiah went back and said, Lord, it's gone. He said, go write the same words. And add to it. And more of Jeremiah's books came out. And then you know what he said to him? Take what you wrote, the very word of God, now the second iteration of that same word. And he said, Go cast it into the river. You think God cares for the originals? No. They were destroyed. They were cast in the river. They were, they're sinking at the bottom of the sea. It's, it's not a big deal unto him because it's him. It's God Almighty that preserves them, that kept them here for us, ready to deliver unto us, ready for us to be whole. I just have to put my faith and trust in that, just the same way I put my faith and trust in the fact that Jesus went to a cross 2,000 years ago to die for my sins. I wasn't there. I didn't see it. I don't understand all the facts, ins and outs of it. But by faith, I say, amen, he did that for me. How do I believe that? The Bible told me so. Okay? we got to come to that point where we just understand. These words the Lord speak. Get the pure words from the pure source, okay? You got power as priests. You have power for, for prayer. You have power for intercession. You have power to go to God directly. Ask help in the time of need. You have, you have power to minister unto people. But all of your power and authority in God comes from the fact that he spake all of these words, saying, okay? <clears throat> Take what he said. Take his very word with you. You shall have great power in this life, and you shall have promise in the life to come. And that's what the first fathers were missing. Unfortunately, that's what their children are following after, making the same mistake. We don't need the Word of God. We just need His meaning. We just need, we just need what He's saying. It's the words. They are spirit. They are life. I thank you.